Welcome to The Mighty Dragon. I was delighted to catch up with director Philip Noyce this weekend. I originally spoke to Philip back in 2018. He was my 20th interview and in my early days of the blog, we spoke about Echoes of Paradise and the changes he had to make, the last minute changes to Echoes of Paradise in the filming location. We also spoke about the challenges of filming at sea for Dead Calm too. This weekend I caught up with Philip to see what he'd been up to since 2018 and I'd really love to thank Philip now personally for always supporting the Mighty Dragon blog in the past and in the future hopefully. Thank you so much. Philip Nice, thank you so much for joining me on the Mighty Dragon today. From Pleasure sunny to be here, Victoria. From sunny LA to cold, blustery England, <laughs> you definitely have the right location. Well, we've had some some cold weather here as well. But, oh, but nothing like what you you yeah. enjoy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm so glad you've joined me here on the podcast. You were actually one one of my first interviews for the Mighty Dragon back in 2018, and I was asking you actually um, quite a bit about Echoes of Paradise. I don't know if you remember about um, how the script was originally Raka's script, and we went into that. But what's happened since 2018 for you? What have you been working on since 2018? Uh, let me think. Uh, I guess I did um, the first two episodes of a Netflix show called What If? Right. Starring, uh, um, Renee Zellweger. Uh, so that was in 2018, I guess, around the time I was talking to you. Um, then after that, I shot a movie. Oh, I shot two movies. I shot uh, one in uh, Canada during COVID. Uh, um, the Desperate Hour with Naomi Watts, which was very much a COVID film because it was uh, it was an under three million dollar budget, and we shot it all in ten days um, out wow. in the, out in the wilds of northern Canada. Um, uh, so that so I made that film, which came out a year ago. Um, then I shot a TV pilot. Uh, um, which didn't go to series in New Orleans. And then with Pierce Brosnan and um, uh, I shot, uh, and Marina Baccarin, I, I shot a feature film, which I'm just finishing now, um, called Fast Charlie. Right. So you've been pretty so, busy then. <laughs> so I've kept, kept <laughs> yelling action and cut. Um, kept uh, waking up with uh, scenes to shoot and scenes to edit and so on. So still yeah. doing still doing the same thing that I've always done since I was 18 years old and now I'm 72. That's incredible. <laughs> so, um, yeah. My my son was asked uh, several years ago, my 14-year-old, he was asked, what should dad do for a living? And in all... Seriousness, he said. He yells, "Action and cut." <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many times you've said that since, like, you were eighteen or something. <laughs> and that is what I do, and I guess yeah. uh, that's what I'll continue to do. And I, I suppose I now, with technology, I could um, record action and cut. Although I suppose you know, <laughs> saying action. You know, it probably yeah. is just as good as a recording of action, but yeah, so I, yeah. maybe I'll just continue to do it as I <laughs> play it off. <laughs> but then when I when finally I can only just say action, <laughs> that's when I'll have to get a recording. So maybe I should record <laughs> it now. Uh, it's like putting blood away for later. Uh, I'll record it. I record a very strong action, and you yeah. know that um, action and cut are the two most valuable words in directing an actor or a crew. Because, I mean, obviously, if it's a love story, you don't say. If it's a love scene, you don't say. And ah, action, you know, <laughs> it's going to be to get them in the mood. It's going to be a 
an action. <laughs> you know, it's a comedy, you know, you're going to have to yeah. put a lilt into your voice, you know. Yeah. And action, you know, and then when the, the scene, the shot is finished, how you say cut tells everyone what's coming up. Cut it. That means it wasn't good enough. <laughs> and cut. That means it was great, you know, yeah. there's not going to be another take. But cut it. <laughs> <laughs> and the one that really tells the, uh, the the crew and the actors what's going on is if you do a term that was taught to me by a director whose major career was during the the uh, depression, and what he would say is not cut but save it, ah. which was to save the negative. Right. You know, stop filming because every foot is valuable. Every foot of film is valuable. Save it right. uh, instead of cut. Um, yeah. Oh, interesting. So, so I'll That's be, the... and maybe I should be saying save it actually as save I get it. up. But will that yeah. confuse yeah. everyone? Like, oh, what's he said? <laughs> well, it would because it's no longer applied. You know, once upon yeah. a time, we used to film on film. Yeah. Film was very wide and, and heavy and costly. Because it wasn't just that you had to buy each little roll of film, you then had to have it processed, and then you had to have a work print, a copy made from that. It was very expensive. Now, of course, uh, you know, all you need to put a film into into a uh, huge cinema is this a camera yeah. about that size. Yeah. In fact, I'm the, one of the patrons of a, of a wonderful film festival in Australia called the Smartphone Film Flickr Fest, um, which is all about and only for films made on smartphones. Right. Written, edited, written, photographed, and edited on a, on a smartphone or a tablet. Right. And here they had 350 entries, including three feature films that have been made entirely on smartphones. That's it's, amazing. Uh, and it's very interesting because, um, of course, young filmmakers who have been brought up and are still using their phones, yeah, they photograph scenes in a completely different way. Um, um, for example, you know, I mean, because they're used to yeah. putting yeah. the camera and moving it all around you know, and so when you look at the films, I mean, they 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 really make most uh, films out there in the cinema look like they were made back in the silent era, because you know a smartphone film is not static. A smartphone film is um, doesn't look like it belongs in an old people's home. <laughs> it's got yeah. the vitality of someone that's been brought up uh, uh, without fear. Yeah. Of, of using this device to express yeah. themselves, you know. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine horror would be a very good genre. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Film, well, but... It's a very good genre, you know, because yeah. in horror, of course, the key is to get the camera behind the, the principal, behind the person who's under threat, because yeah. the camera behind someone immediately makes us feel unsettled. Anyway, yeah. yes, um, great movies and... That's my film school at the moment is watching the um, first films of smartphone filmmakers because that's such a learning curve. Yeah. How to throw out the rules. It's yeah. sort of like as, as, as is TikTok, you know. Yeah. Wow. Oh, it's crazy, so isn't it? Watch TikTok and you'll see, you know, six-year-olds, uh, you know, the Steven Spielberg of, of 20 47 um, yeah. will be there uh, yeah. on TikTok with, with something that they've made with their friends. Yeah, uh, it's crazy. Uh, it is crazy. Uh, yeah, it's all crazy. It's all crazy at the moment. The whole, of course, we've film industry is coming out of COVID, trying to get back on its feet, but I think uh, it's still on its knees. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a couple of breakthroughs come out every so often, like at the moment. Wakanda Forever um, is doing well, but yeah. uh, adult movies, serious movies, 
no, adults just want to stay home. Yes. Uh, they've been taught to lock the door and turn on their computer or television and yeah. just dial up one of the 10,000 films that are available or TV oh. programs that are available. Yeah. And it's unbelievable now. It's like a, it's, I mean, when I was young, I really did like to be a kid in the candy store. You know, you'd go to the candy store and you see all this wonderful candy and just imagine what you would do if you could bathe in it. But anyway, now you just switch on your computer and go to Netflix and it's like, oh, my God, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm, in a, I'm a kid in a candy store. So yeah. many choices to make. I do feel that I think as a child watching Star Wars in the cinema, to have not seen that in the cinema, I wonder if it would have had as big an impact, you know, as it did in the cinema. I wonder. No, I mean, uh, it's it's not the same. Yeah. And uh, by the way, um, at the and I can say that because I've just had a dose of cinema, because at the moment here in Los Angeles, uh, in November, we're into the Academy Awards season when all the films that are vying to be nominated are vying for our attention. And two things that I've noticed. Once, at the Academy's uh, theatre, Samuel Goldwyn Theatre on Wilshire Boulevard here in Los Angeles, um, when a movie played, the theatre, which holds a couple of thousand people, would be full. Yeah. Now, you know, it, it, feels like, it feels like a funeral, you know. Uh, wow. there's, there's maybe at the most 200 people, even at a very popular film, um, which does is a, a clear demonstration that older people, because it's generally older people who are in the academy and have time to go and watch these movies, older people are just not going back to the cinema. Um, but the good news is that it reminded me, because I can sit in that huge cinema there, it just reminds me that, yes, you're right, there's no nothing like the cinema experience in a great big theatre not with 2,000 people, but yeah. at least with 200, I'll settle for. Um, just watching um, actors on a big screen is just nothing yeah. like it. watching action sequences, uh, hearing the sound as it yeah. hits you like a, uh, like a missile. Yeah. Yeah, or like watching Bond film in a 4D cinema was awesome, you know. But um, I wanted to ask you, looking back at all of your work, your body of work, can you pick a favourite? Oh, that's <laughs> easy. Uh, uh, rabbit, proof, rabbit Proof Fence is my favourite. Oh. Easily my favourite, yeah, 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 yeah. Why is that? Uh, uh, why is it? Uh, because it answered a lot of questions that I had growing up in Australia. Where in where my small country town in southwest New South Wales had outside it what so many country towns in Australia have still to this day, although they don't exist quite in the same way, and that is a what we called a reserve, or what in America would be called a reservation. In other words, an area where all of the First Nation Indigenous people had been herded and corralled supposedly for their safety, the real story was because yeah. their land had been taken and, and and they had to be put somewhere, so they mixed them all up between different uh, clans and bloodlines and so on and, and send them to the reserve. So outside my town was a reserve, and we, we often, or not often, but twice a year we'd drive past and we'd see all these black people inside there, but we never saw them in town and nobody ever talked about them. It was like yeah. out of sight, out there, beyond the town limits, and but out of mind as well. Yeah. So this is strange. We, it's like we had Martians. They might as well have been Martians because they weren't included in the census. They weren't citizens until 1967. They were not counted as humans. Oh. Um, so naturally, you're growing up and, you know, you can ignore it for a while, but then 
so many of these First Nation people started to do something that made, made the Australian public worship them. They became sporting heroes and heroines. Right. And there's nothing like that to wake up an Australian. Okay, we've yeah. got the world champion tennis player living out on the re- in the reserve outside town, Yvonne Gulligan. She's got to be an Australian because she's a champion. She's Middleton's champion. But, 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 so that's why I wanted to make the film, to answer the unasked questions from my youth. But I also wanted to make it because at the time, everyone said, don't bother. You'll never raise the money. And even if you do, you've got to realise that no one is interested in First Nation stories. So you'll never be able to sell the movie. You'll never be able to, you'll never find an audience. And I thought, they're fighting words. Yeah. You'll never be able to. You'll never be able to do this. Rubbish, I said to myself. Yeah. I'm going to prove those people wrong. I'm going to make a film. And, and, and honestly, at first, we filmed the ending on the equivalent of, of this instrument, just an old handy cam that I had. Yeah. The ending, which is um, two of the characters, uh, fictional characters in the film. Now we meet at the end of the movie the real people in their 80s still survive to this day. And I photographed that to begin with. And I said to myself, if I can't raise the money, if these naysayers are right, I'll just photograph the whole film on my Sony Handycam. As it turned out, we did raise the money. And as it turned out, we did convince Australians to go and see the movie. The movie made more than twice its money back. It sold all around the world and and was compared to budget, the most successful film that I ever made. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's why it's my favourite. And then, it, and also because it contributed to the national debate about the so-called stolen generations, the generations of Indigenous children who were removed from their parents and sent to these re-education centres to be, to have the, the the First Nation um, language and customs removed from their psyche and and, uh, and they were to be taught to be useful in a white society, which generally meant, you know, that the women would be taught to be uh, um, domestics and, yeah. and the, men, uh, the men to be farm workers. Anyway, later, about 10 years after the movie came out, the Prime Minister of Australia uh, rose in Parliament on the first day of the new Parliament and made an apology to those who had been removed forcefully, uh, those Indigenous people who had been removed. So I felt in my heart that the film had contributed to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, apology and, and had made a difference within Australia, but also mainly because, you know, I was able to share a story that was true with people all over the world. Yeah. Um, as opposed to the movies that I made here in Hollywood, which um, have I made some true stories? A couple, I guess, but mainly they were other people's stories. They were not stories that came out of my own experience. Yeah. And, and and you know, and and, they, and although telling them involved a lot of emotion, it wasn't a heartfelt experience for me, whereas making Rabbit Proof Fence was a heartfelt experience. You know, it was a film that was made from my heart. Wow. Oh, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. We spoke briefly about streaming and how audiences can stream quite very easily now. Have you had to adapt to how you work to accommodate this? Not really, not really. Um, it's changed my way of viewing. A few things, right. Of viewing, you yeah. know. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm still making what I hope will be theatrical films. This next one um, is actually, not only does it star um, Pierce Brosnan, but it also is the last movie of the legendary actor uh, James Kahn, who died seven weeks after he oh, was on, on our set. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy oh. was uh, 
plays in the movie a senile crime boss. Um, oh. And uh, he, he passed away seven, seven weeks after his last shot. Oh. After I said cut to him when he heard that for the last time. Um, so that's that's a movie that's coming out next August around the yeah. world, hopefully in your local cinema. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> but whether it does make it to your local cinema will depend really on, uh, you know, whether people get back into the habit of going to the cinema. Yes. And the, and the jury is out at the moment on mm. that. Do do movies made for a small screen, are they different? Yes, inevitably they are. Um, you'll use more close-ups. If you know it's going to end up on a smaller screen, you won't shoot like Kurosara where, you know, a close-up is that big and you'll shoot, you know, a close-up. I mean, inevitably, people will keep will keep telling stories where that's a close-up, not what we call a mid-shot. Um, and, you and you'll find that um, there won't be so much staging in master shots, John Ford type staging, yeah. uh, um, you know, um, where you allow the, the physical dimensions of a room to be etched into the audience's minds. They can see everything. Yeah. So, you know, you so you won't have you won't have a scene like that, but you will have a scene like that. Right. That, that will be you. So that's going to change the way people uh, um, make movies. I think inevitably oh. because um, if we if we continue this trend, which finally is going to mean that we all end up. <laughs> Not just make it using these for our for our phones, and uh, but you know where that that's the way that we'll watch movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So obviously, a wide shot's going to mean a lot less when you're watching your movie. <laughs> yes. On, on that side screen. <laughs> Absolutely. And when you're on a, sh a, a, a shoot, do you stick to the script or do you go off script much? Can you afford um, to? Yeah, you you got to. you got to go off script um, because, uh, one, often the script doesn't fit into the day, meaning you can't finish the scene in, in the day that you've got or the time that you've got. So you've got to finish the scene. So you'll make... You know, you'll always go into a scene with an A, B, C, D plan, four plans of what you're going to do. And and you've got to think on your feet, you know, um, you, you're filming a scene and it calls for the ending of the scene, you know, the character shoots four people dead. Well, shooting people dead is not a quick... Yeah. Thing too. <laughs> that can take hours. So, you know, you might, it's, uh, or you've only got an hour to go. Right. And you, uh, you might make the decision, okay, he won't shoot anyone dead, but he'll just hold his gun up and then they'll retreat back and he'll go out the door, which um, can be just as amusing as yeah. killing people is not that amusing. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> So yeah, you're always you're always you're always making those not compromises, making those decisions so that the amount of screen time you need to get fits into the day that you only have. Right. Okay. And yeah. also there's nothing worse for an actor than a director that's not that won't listen to them. Right. So that makes actors anxious. They can't it, if they think that this person is calling action and can't, can't hear them. Um, so you're always looking, but you're always looking for, because what it is, is you are a ringmaster. I think we spoke about this a few years ago. You're the ringmaster of a circus. 
you're commanding the show and keeping it going, signaling when the drum roll should should sound, bringing on the clowns and so on. But you're yeah. as much as you are in control of the whole thing. You're also dependent on the skill of the people you're working with. So right. you're always wanting a great film is made by all 150 people who are making it. Right. And the director is there to draw out from the actors and the other crew members ideas that make him or her look smart. It's only in your own interests that you do that. So uh, you you go off script a lot because of good ideas that really smart people give you on the set, you know. And an actor is often the best uh, um, inventor of a better scene. Wouldn't yeah. it be better if I said this rather than that, you know? And, yes, films can go off the rails if the director listens to too many people um, and yeah. hasn't got the ability to, to be able to be an instant judge of what's better or what's worse. But on the other hand, the film, making a film where you only use your own ideas, uh, where you're only reliant on, on the limitations of your own uh, uh, mental and, and creative energy, um, you know, you, you're going to stagnate, particularly as you get older, you know, because you do close down a little bit. So in some ways, as I get older, I become even more, uh, uh, um, I'm dependent on all the others that I'm working with. Yeah, yeah. From your films so far, would you shoot any again? Would I shoot any of them again? Yeah. What are they? <laughs> I, I don't think I want to go back to any of them because, um, You know, they are like children, really. I mean, it's, yeah. once the child is here, um, <laughs> it's your job. I'll go back and change that bit. To guide, guide them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, the deed is done. Um, right. So I might think that I could improve them, but I don't think I want to go back and do it because yeah. I'm – it's all I want to do, and I'm doing. I'm doing it all the time. Is I just want to get them through this life and onto um, their next adventure. And by that, I mean I'm constantly remastering the films that I've made. Oh. For example, at the moment, while preparing to remaster Rabbit Proof Fence, I'm also supervising the remastering of The Saint. With Val Kilmer and Elizabeth Shue. Oh Back wow! Yeah. Tomorrow I'll go to Paramount Pictures uh, at ten o'clock in the morning and look at the remastered Saint, and then they're also working over there on remastering Rabbit Proof Fans. Um, so this is uh, and, and remastering Rabbit Proof Fans in order that it's. In, in order that it's in in a in, in a um, what do you call it? What would you call it? In a system? No. In order that it's it technically qualifies to go on to the next twenty years of its life, meaning that um, it can be screened in huge big auditoriums or with the highest degree of reproduction just on your phone, etc. Yeah. So. We're constantly, technology is constantly revising um, the way in which we present films to an audience. I must admit that when I go through and I do a, um, a, a, a uh, remastering, I do make a few changes. For example, anyone who's seen The Saint will know that uh, the Val Kilmer character is introduced um, early in the movie as pretending that he's a, a, a Russian um, guard and so he enters a building where he's going to steal some diamonds. And Val, after seeing the movie, had always complained to me, he said, in that scene, it's all about the Russians, but you haven't really got a close-up that identifies me to the audience. So as I'm sitting there a month ago and looking at the remastering of The Saint, I said, I said, stop, stop, stop. 
Look, hey, look, I'm just getting memory flash here from Val Kimmer complaining to me all those years ago. Let's go back <laughs> to that scene and let's let's take that shot, which was yeah. a very wide shot, and let's use the technology, which we have now, and change the, the, the size of the screen or size of the shot so that the audience can really see that that's Val Kilmer who's trying to sneak into that building. Right. Whereas in the original, you know, even the guy that was operating the, the um, was doing the, the, the remastering said, is that him? I, I don't really see him. And so I said, go, go in, in, in. Yeah. So, yeah, we did, we do change it. We do, <laughs> I do do little tinkering now that I yeah. recall. Um, in that case, to satisfy the complaint that an actor made to me, 28 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> you remembered. That's amazing. <laughs> Stayed in there all those years. What would be your, and I think you may have touched on this already, what's your biggest challenge now as a filmmaker? The biggest challenge? Yeah. I'm not as young as I used to be. So, and and ageism, of course, operates. Right. Mm. Sort of still got some hair. <laughs> doing my best to <laughs> yeah. turn myself into a uh, a um, mad professor look. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a long way from that guy. Look at him, how beautiful. Wow. <laughs> oh. Amazing. <laughs> so, so trying to uh, – trying to – Convince people that you've still got it, whatever it is. Um, that's the biggest challenge. That you're still relevant. Yeah. Going into my seventy third year, and maybe maybe that's a that's a challenge that um, is in my imagination. But whether it's in my imagination or whether it's uh, the, the other people's perceptions, it's still valid because even if it's only my own fear that I'm not relevant, that's an impetus to seize on using technology and so on yeah. to, 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 to make yourself relevant. So relevancy, that's the biggest challenge, which can yeah. be, you know, how you're perceived or how you perceive yourself. Yes, that's very interesting. Um, are there any special memories that you'd like to share with us um, on the films that you've made? Any that particularly stand out for you that you'll never well, forget? Yes. If you go to Clear and Present Danger, um, about two-thirds of the way through, no, maybe it's halfway through, maybe two-thirds, I don't know. Anyway, an American uh, missile is launched from an from a plane over Colombia, and the missile um, ends up uh, hitting a house, the house supposedly of a drug lord, of a Colombian dr drug lord. And uh, the memory, and nowadays we would do that explosion totally with through CGI. But back then, uh, we still did things for real. So I can remember sitting on top of a hill <laughs> and looking down and saying to my location manager, that's the house, that's perfect. Okay, so the missile comes in and it sails over here and um, it hits the house. So we went down to the house, knocked on the door. Lady came to the door. The uh, Location manager explained what we wanted to do, and she said, oh, I hate this house. You can buy it off me and destroy it. <laughs> she, she, she had just concluded a, a very acrimonious <laughs> divorce. <laughs> she owned the house, but she, but she was very happy that an American film company wanted to fill it with dynamite and blow it up. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's what we that's what we did. Not that day, but we came back later. And so have a look at the house. It's quite a little, nice little place. Nowadays we would wouldn't really blow up a house, but in those yeah. days we did. 
<laughs> you never know, it could have been our ex's house. Just blow it up. <laughs> that was a macabre but fond memory of the good old days. You'll see the house. Go to go to the yeah. Terrible Danger, scroll through, and you'll see that house going up. It looks like it's 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 not a real house because actually what we found was that the house was made of concrete, and so when it exploded, it was it wasn't like it was there, and then the, a lot of uh, beams and things were flying through the air. It just disappeared in a puff of puff of smoke of cement. You know, it just oh. yeah, and then it was gone. There yeah. wasn't. I mean, considering <laughs> all the dynamite that we used and the sixteen cameras that were focusing on it, uh, yeah. much ado about not much. <laughs> I'm totally watching that tonight. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask. You've worked with many actors over the years. Who, if you can say, has stood out to you as just being an outstanding actor? Um, Michael Caine, easily. Oh wow! Yeah. The Quiet American, it was his 106th movie. Wow. And um, he taught me something very important. By his actions, he showed me that he had worked out in all those movies that the most important thing that an actor can do is to empower the director, not to disempower them but to empower because his performance, the performance of the film, the success of the film is entirely dependent on making the director confident, supporting him or her, sending them out each morning full of vitality and ideas because they know that the leading man supports them and he was that kind of a guy. Wow. But that was his ethos. That was his, um, his ethic was total support for the director. And when you think about it, that's really important. You know, how, yes. how, how essential is that emotional support, that creative support um, to, because, you know, you, I mean, I'm about to do a, a couple of days of additional, a couple of additional days of shooting on uh, uh, on Fast Charlie, this film that with uh, Pierce Brosnan, um, I've just come back from New Orleans, and I tell you, as I get closer to the day we're going to shoot in a couple of weeks, I hope that it'll go away. But at night, you know, I'm constantly having nightmares about impossible situations where I'm forced to make decisions to either put the camera there or do this or do that. It's just a recurring nightmare, dream, you know. So insecurity is what fuels you in a way as a director. Yeah. Um, but but having someone like a Michael Caine to say, don't worry, old boy, whatever you decide, I'm going to be there, you're the king or queen, if it's a female director, whatever, Having someone like that is really important. Wow. Uh, and I remember working with him every day, just wanting to wake up and get out there. Great. You know, but sometimes you wake up on a, on a when you're shooting, you know, and you wake up with trepidation. And, oh my God, I'm not sure I can face today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I'm, I'm actually quite shocked you said Michael Caine. I wasn't expecting that, but he seems such a good person as well. So that's he good is. To him. You know, yeah. he's thankful. Uh, he grew up on the wrong side of the of the tracks. Yeah. Um, he's made a success of his life. He's yeah. made you know, so many different movies. Yeah. He's had yeah. So many rebirths. Yeah. Um, you know. So he's 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 thankful. Do you know that Michael Caine fought in the Korean War? Yes, yes. Wasn't and there a picture of him in Harry Brown in his military? Yeah. He fought in the Korean War, but not only that, you know that at that time um, the Allies uh, were facing a very 
potent secret weapon. The secret weapon was the human charge where 10,000, and I'm not sure whether he was facing uh, Chinese or North Korean soldiers. Right. He had many nights where the, the British unit that he was a part of were facing a human wave, endless human waves, you know, the idea being that, that eventually soldiers, the, the, the defenders will run out of bullets and you'll overrun them. Yeah. Uh, his description of that kind of ridiculous warfare was very harrowing. So, so n- not only, you know, does he have the experience of, of learning how to make successful films, but he also has the life experience that makes uh, a real actor, you know. Yeah, amazing. Um, I've got just two questions left for you. Um, yes. What do you yourself watch on TV? Um, are you watching a series or any films that you found impressive recently? Um, the last uh, film that I watched uh, is the German film All Quiet on the Western Front. Right. Um, which is um, um, the first time that Germans have made a, an adaptation of a German, of a yeah. novel written in German. Um in many ways, that's the most impressive film that I've that I've I've seen lately. It's such a beautiful film, uh, photographed by uh, an English um, cinematographer, um, and uh, it, it has brilliant use of music. I mean, if you really want to learn about music, um, watch that movie. Uh, it uses a a motif that reminds one of the sound of the spaceships in in Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. If you remember, the spaceships would make a... (laughs) Watch uh, All Quiet on the Western Front and hear that motif reused to to send chills through your body when you hear it. Because it 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 it's 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 it represents the hell that was trench warfare. It represents the hell of politicians sending treating men as as cannon fodder. Yeah. It represents the hell of war warfare, um, and and which is particularly appropriate at this moment in time. In Europe, with the, with the horrific uh, war going on, you yes. know, in the east there, in Ukraine. Um, the other film that uh, that I've watched lately that I really love was Tar, T A R, uh, starring Kate Blanchett as a famous um, um, conductor, uh, um, orchestra conductor. Uh, it's a very interesting film. Uh, in the way it examines the Me Too era. Right. Um, and I won't say too much about it because yeah. when you see the film, because it'll give, give away too much. Um, uh, that's a film that I've very much enjoyed lately. Um, I also was very pleased to see The Whale, uh, Brendan Fraser's uh, yeah. comeback, you know, he who was in The Quiet American. Um, who went through a lean period um, and is now, you know, yeah. poised to yeah. be nominated for, for an Academy Award for this amazing performance yeah. as a 600-pound man uh, who yeah. lived wow. alone in an apartment. Um, brilliant performance. Um, and, you know, I did in, very much enjoy... Viola Davis in Woman King, which is very similar to Wakanda Forever, um, in as much as they're both about they're both about female warriors. Yeah, um, Woman King um, um, is is brilliantly made. Uh, Wakanda Forever is also brilliantly made, but a completely different genre. Um, but uh, um, so Woman King is another one that I'd recommend everyone catching up with. Yeah. Um, the disappointing thing about it is 
that um, it's not completely true in its re- in its telling of history, but it, but it's a wonderful movie. In television, I've been watching The Watcher. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, not that it's it's not brilliant, but it's compelling. Yeah, you can't stop wondering who The Watcher is. Yeah, I see that there's another uh, another series coming. Um, yeah. Ah, right. It wasn't resolved in the first eight episodes, so. Yes. Yes. I thought I thought they'd left that open for another season. <laughs> yeah. Um, just finally, my last question. Um, next year, I'll be looking at the work of Stanley Kubrick for this blog, and I just wanted to know what you thought about his style of directing and how, what's that meant to you over the years. Well, yeah, I mean, I love Spartacus. I think um, near the end, uh, Spartacus um, reaches under the halter of his lover. And I saw that at a time in the 1950s when I was just starting to awaken <laughs> myself to what, what he was doing there. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but I also, it wasn't just because it was an, an early um, sexual stirring but also just because of those incredible shots of the Roman battalions yeah. uh, marking, you know, the way that Kubrick shot the film. And Dr. Strangelove, of course, is another one. I think they're the, my two favourites. Right. Um, um, Spartacus, because of the epic nature of the filmmaking and because of that one scene, <laughs> um, and... Uh, Doctor Strange Love, just because I, I, you know, it was just so amusing, such yeah. a wonderful satire. Um, yeah. Two thousand and one. Uh, yeah. I, I never really got into like I did those two films. Right. Uh, but you know, this this uh, this director was so restrained in the way he did things. You know, um, implication. Uh, worked in his movies so so strongly, you know, he would imply something. Although I suppose blood coming out of um, coming out of the wall uh, in The Shining yeah. wasn't by implication, but it certainly yeah. was uh, chilling. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, David Lean is my all time great, right? Followed by Bernardo Bertolucci, right? Um, David Lean, uh, Dr. Shivago is just a masterpiece to me. Lawrence of Arabia, another masterpiece. Oh, yes. Yes. Epic, epic scale. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and then Bernardo <laughs> Bertolucci, The Last Emperor, a story told on the same huge scale, and I was there when he was filming yes. it. I was, yeah. in, I was in Beijing yeah. watching him on his set. While he was filming with four thousand extras, you know, it's amazing. It was amazing to watch the filming, um, um, but Bertolucci, because you know, every image in every movie is just so beautiful. Yeah, you know, captivating, ravishing imagery. Yeah. Uh, what an amazing yeah. opportunity for you! You were speak, going to speak oh. to John about Echoes of Paradise, and yes, you got I to was. see the, the entire set of The Last Emperor. <laughs> I did indeed, um, and uh, and I also, by the way, met uh, Federico Fellini. Wow. Not there, not in Beijing, yeah. but uh, in Rome. I hung out in Place de Popolo, and there I befriended Federico Fellini, who invited me to come out to Cinicitta where he was putting the finishing touches to one of his minor films called Orchestra Rehearsal. And uh, he was adding the sound because it was recorded without dialogue and then the, they put the dialogue in later. And um, it was it was um, Federico Fellini who gave me the best advice I ever got in the movie business and he because he said, you know that sound is much more important than image. I said, what do you mean? How can that be so? He said, because the image, when you see it, it has to go to your brain and be decoded, the meaning, whereas the sound, it goes from the ear into the central nervous system. 
Oh there's no gosh. there's no need for the brain to do anything. Ear hits you, sound hits yeah. you. Yeah. Because it's like Jaws, isn't it, without that music? Yeah. All yeah. right. Oh, that ends our questions today. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, well, it was such a pleasure. I hope you'll come back and uh, check oh, out absolutely. and see how my action and <laughs> <laughs> It's going. <laughs> Thank you so much for today, and I'll see you soon on the Mighty Dragon. Thank you, it's Philip. My Mike. pleasure. Okay, Thank bye. You. Bye, bye. Bye. -bye.